Hello, uh, Dusty members and friends of Dusty. Today, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you the Prof. Uh, Gita Kunikiok, uh, that uh, he's a professor from the uh, University of uh, Munich or Universita of München. And he see, uh, sees uh, currently the Bavarian AI Chair for Mathematical Foundation of Artificial Intelligence at the uh, Ludwig Maximilian from the University of Mohan. Uh, we, you know, all of you know that uh, artificial intelligence has a strong background in mathematics and also deep learning, but now is the state of the, the art in several uh, uh, tasks of uh, deep learning, uh, has a strong fundamental uh, mathematical fundamentals. All of us, we work with uh, deep learning, but uh, we maybe we are not uh, aware of uh, all this important part of deep learning and machine learning. And I and we think that it's very important that we have to, to, to know a little bit more about, about that. So for this reason, we thought that, uh, that we need this kind of training. Uh, we think that the Prof. Gita Kunikio is the best uh, uh, person that uh, can speak to us about uh, this, uh, this mathematical foundation. Because now, since the, uh, the previous chair of the Science Activity Group in Data Science, and also uh, since the coordinator of the long term program of mathematics of deep learning. So, Prof. Putiniak, you are free when you want. Okay, we are prepared to listen to you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so very much for the very nice introduction, also for the invitation. It's really a great pleasure and honor for me to give a talk here in your uh, institute. So, let me start by sharing my screen. Um, yeah, so mathematics of deep learning, what I would like to do in this talk, I would like to give you, let's say, an overview of different research directions people are currently interested in, um, show you a bit also the state of the art and also show you where there are still a lot of open questions and I mean, obstacles where, I mean, a lot of mathematics is required to actually overcome those. I think we all know that uh, deep learning has a tremendous impact of, on our lives and will, uh, which will increase significantly certainly over the next year. So self-driving cars, telecommunication, legal issues, uh, like for instance in the United States also some lawsuits are decided to a certain extent by uh, these type of algorithms and then the whole healthcare sector which as we know unfortunately these days became even more important than it already is. Then if we get a bit closer to the sciences, I mean here you see in uh, biology, um, DeepMind's AI approach uh, lead to a, led to a breakthrough, so AlphaFold2, um, which can predict the folding of protein structures, and you see what a, what a let's say, quantum leap um, this could achieve. Then if we get a bit even closer to or into mathematics itself, we also see that on that area, it has a tremendous impact, for instance, in the area of imaging sciences. So most problems in imaging sciences are inverse problems. And uh, since 2012, what one can observe is that these the previous traditional methods are more and more replaced or let's say improved by deep learning methods. So today, if you go to conferences, basically 90% of the talks in this area are about these new techniques. Uh, and so there's a long list of problems one aims to solve in this area, denoising, edge detection, in painting, and so on and so on. Then, I mean, if you're interested in solving partial differential equations, um, you might have observed that since 2017, these methods also have a tremendous impact on that area. Uh, so nowadays, PDEs are often solved by neural networks or by neural network-based approaches. And you see it is much, much later than 2012, the reason is that, I mean, these problems, I mean, there's no rigorous theory what an image is. So in that sense, I mean, these learning methods are extremely natural. For PDEs, it's not that natural because the PDE is a physical model. So the question is, why do you need deep learning and what turn out is that in the high dimensional regime, these methods can overcome the curse of dimensionality. 
So this all looks very bright, very exciting. But then if you look a bit on the other side, I mean, you, for instance, I mean, see articles of that type. It was an interesting incident. I mean, already now a couple of years ago, but still to a certain extent true these days um, were at one of the big high conferences. Um, one of the speakers who actually won a prize and gave a plenary talk, Ali Rahimi, he claimed that machine learning at this stage is uh, more or less alchemy, that researchers, um, as he says, don't know why algorithms work and why others maybe don't and which architecture to choose. Yeah, so there's a lot of trial and error. So from a, let's say, mathematics viewpoint or in general viewpoint from, from theory, I mean, it is lacking uh, the theoretical foundation. Now you can say, well, I mean, why do we need a theoretical foundation? But then, I mean, what you realize is that there are also tremendous problems with these methods. Now, so for instance, then you see articles like this, problem with trustworthiness. Now, so here BBC wrote, computers can be made to see sea turtle as a gun. Uh, and for self-driving cars, it's known, for instance, that you can easily fool them by putting stickers on traffic signs and misguiding them. And there are many examples of that type, which are typically uh, often labeled as adversarial examples. Uh, and so, I mean, already at the, at the early stage, I mean, for instance, a researcher from electric engineering uh, had this very, I think, nice article called Deep, Deep Trouble, Deep Learning's Impact on Image Processing, Mathematics and Humanity. And in that he talks about the fact that now these new methods kind of sweep the area but we don't have any deep understanding of them. They're a bit like, well, magic, alchemy, mystery. Uh, but I mean, for sensitive applications, also in telecommunication, in health, and so on and so on, we often need certificates um, to check whether these methods really work and what we get out is what we need. And this is still, I mean, to a large extent missing. So from my viewpoint, I mean, there are two main challenges or two main directions one, one can go. One is what I might call mathematics for deep learning. So this aims for deriving a theoretical understanding of deep learning. For instance, can we make that more robust? Um, can we analyze generalization abilities and so on? And then the opposite direction, deep learning for mathematics. So asking mathematical problem setting like imaging science or PDE solvers. How can we use these new methods in the most effective way? Ah, and so in each of those directions, I would like to show you a couple of examples, um, what maybe to a certain extent has been done, what is still open. But let's start a bit slower, um, what uh, neural networks are. I'd like to give you a brief introduction to those so that everybody is on the same level. Now, everything started already very early with McCulloch and Pitts in, in 1943. And uh, they wanted to, well, I mean, build something which is intelligent. Uh, so an algorithmic approach to learning and the idea was very smart. Humans are quite good in the task, I mean, typically. And they wanted to mimic the functionality of the human brain. Yeah, and so, I mean, from things of biology, the human brain consists of neurons which have interconnected, um, interconnecting dendrites. And so the, First idea is to mimic a neuron to introduce an artificial neuron uh, and then go from there and build an artificial neural network. So what is an artificial neuron? Um, so let's first look at, a, look at a real neuron. It gets some signals in here. So these are called x1, x2, x3. Then these could be amplified due to the structure of these dendrites. This is mimicked by these weights. So we multiply the input with the weight. And then in the SOMA, everything is collected. So I just sum everything up. So what arrives here is this sum. And now here, the neuron needs to decide whether to fire or not. And the way it decides this is, for instance, by a threshold. If it's above the threshold, it fires, otherwise not. And so here, the bias could be, for instance, B, and we check whether the sum is greater than B or less or equal than B, and depending on that, we output a one or a zero. Uh, and uh, there's some background noise. I don't know. Um, I don't know. Sorry, I'm looking to mute uh, that person. 
Okay, so, so this is an artificial neuron, which we now connect to a neural network. And later on, what we, what, what we aim to learn are these weights and the biases. Yeah? So this is the, these are the parameters of the neural network, which we then adapt during the training phase. Um, so how does it look a bit more formal? Um, so I have my weights, I have my biases, I have now a so-called activation function. And then an artificial neuron is just this function. Uh, and you see immediately looks very similar to the previous page where here we had the heavy heavy side function, either I output one or zero, but I can certainly put a lot of other functions at this point. And so there are a lot of other, what's one called activation functions. The heavy side function is from the previous page, either a fire or not, but I can choose also something smooth like the sigmoidal function and what is nowadays I, I mean, in basically all applications used is what's called the rectifiable linear unit, the ReLU, which is a very simple function. It's the max of zero and X. So it goes like this, it's zero and then it's X. Um, and apparently, I mean, for applications, it's typically sufficient. And it's also piecewise linear. It's very easy for the training phase. So this is usually, I mean, uh, the choice which, uh, which people take for applications. Okay, so that's one artificial neuron, and now we need to connect those. Um, and maybe let's take a look first here. Yeah, so I go from top to bottom. All these yellow dots are now artificial neurons. I get here my input, and then it has an output, my input, my output, and so on. And so this now I encode in this way. Uh, so I have here x1, x2, x3. Then these connections I encode by a matrix. You see the first component of the output is this weight times x1 plus this weight times x2. These are the two connections. Then here I get this weight times x3. This is this connection. And here this weight times x3, it's this connection. Then I add the Bs here and I apply the activation function. And then I keep going. I now need to encode these connections. This I do by this matrix, because it now goes to R2. You see the matrix here. I again add the bias term, maybe an activation function, and so on and so on. And from this, you can guess how the general formula looks like. Um, so a general neural network has, is a function of this type, let's say from Rn to, let's say, R1, or okay, want to have a bit more flexibility. And you see here are these affine linear functions. If you go back, yeah, so we have here Wx plus b, and here also W something plus b. Oh, and so this is like an iterative procedure um, in a certain sense, always applying this affine linear function and the activation function, which is um, univariate. So I apply it component-wise as we saw before. Oh, and typically important is also the number of layers of a neural network, which coincides with the number of affine linear functions. OK, so that's a deep neural network. Let's, let's see how it, how it acts, how you operate with it. And this will lead us canonically to the key open questions. So what do you do usually? I mean, you have a very complicated function in the background. Could also be distribution, but let's stick with the functional setting right now. You have a function which is defined on some maybe not on the whole RD, maybe on a lower dimension object, maybe manifold, something else. Maybe it's a classification function. Yeah, so usually, I mean, the easiest examples is always separating cats from dogs. So let's say I have here some lower dimension structure where my images lie on. And then in one area, I have images of cats or here and here I have images of dogs. And I map one to the value one and the other to the value two. But what I have at hand are just sample values, so just a couple of images with their respective label of function value. Then I split this into a training as a test data set. And the test data set is just used later on. The neural network doesn't see it during training, and I just use the training data for well training. Then I select an architecture of a neural network. I choose well how many layers I take, how many neurons in each layer which activation function. Um, sometimes I pre-select certain entries of these weight matrices to be already set 
to be equal to zero because I don't want to have a fully connected network because that makes training much more difficult. So then, I mean, once I've done that, um, I need to train the neural network and we already said what training means. It means learning the matrices and the bias vectors. And so this is what one does here. It looks very complicated, but um, what you see here is this is the network function evaluated in these samples. And I would like this certainly to be close to these labels f of xi. The closeness is given by a loss function, so it would be the square loss, so the norm difference squared of those, but also something else. Then I sum everything up, all the training examples, and this I minimize. Maybe I want to have some additional properties. Maybe I would like to have sparsity of the weights and the biases, then I can add a regularization to it. So then I minimize this, this functional, I optimize this. This is typically done by stochastic gradient descent. I mean, then you can ask why not use gradient descent? Um, the problem is that usually you have millions of training examples, so M is in the millions, and you don't want to compute a million gradients each time. And so therefore what one does is just randomly pick either one sample or a batch of samples and just compute the gradient for those. And so this leads to this stochastic gradient descent, which is usually the training approach. And then we learn the weight matrix, the biases, this leads us to the network function. Once we have that, we have our trained neural network, and now we can test how good it does. And this is done by using the test data set. So now what I do is I plug in the network function, these XIs from the test data set and check whether the labels are correct. Yeah, so this is basically the pipeline. And from this, also the key theoretical questions arise. Now, so you see the first question is already which architecture to choose. That's, oh, sorry. Actually, I want to say something first. Um, so what I wanted to say first is, um, why is this actually so successful these days? Uh, we saw everything started in 1943. Um, but at that time, obviously, as we know, it wasn't that successful. And the reason, there are actually two main reasons for that, why neural networks are now that successful. One is that we have now a lot more computing power. So we have deep neural networks and deep refers to the number of layers. That seems to make a huge difference. And theory is also still struggling to understand why this depth is so important. The other advantage is that we are living in the age of data. And so we have huge amount of training data available. Uh, and so you saw, I mean, we need training data, but usually the more, the better. That's what people typically say. And um, therefore, this is also key. Still, I mean, there are actually some mysteries which are, I mean, very unresolved and we will i mean later on when we see the list of key mathematical questions we will come back to that but let's already here look look at two of those one is what one says overfitting why don't neural networks overfit so what is this overfitting phenomenon let's assume you would like to separate these um, green circles from the blue stars if your network is well i mean very small, you can just draw lines basically, do linear separation. I mean, you will never separate those two uh, types of features. Uh, so that's underfit. Then if you have more, a bit more flexibility, maybe you can draw lines like this. And so this all looks, looks like a very good separation between this, maybe this green dot might be an outlier. So, so this looks actually quite nice. Then if your network has too much flexibility, what could happen, would be that it tries to enclose the, the data too much. It aims to do the job too good. And so that leads to the fact that, I mean, it looks extremely artificial. Yeah? So you see here, I mean, this point is, is I mean, it was high probability an outlier, but still, I mean, now it tries to enclose it. So if another blue star, which you put here, it will misclassify it and so on. Yeah, so that's this overfitting phenomena and apparently neural networks don't run into that risk for some reason. And you see that here, I mean, so this is what usually from statistical learning theory, people could prove and analyze. You see here the size of the neural network. You see here the, the error. Now the training error as the network size grows, the training error will go down because you have more flexibility. 
the test error after some point will go up. And that's this overfitting phenomenon here. But now in the neural network setting, this is true. You see the left-hand side coincides with this figure, but the right-hand side here, the test risk, the test error goes down again. And that's so surprising. This is called double descent curve, this phenomena. And so it's so surprising that after some point, the test risk again goes down and actually much more than it previously had. So therefore, typically, I mean, the larger the network, the better. That's kind of a rule of thumb to a certain extent. So that's one mystery. The other mystery is the training algorithm itself. I said stochastic gradient descent is uh, usually um, the choice. And you see here, normal gradient descent would always follow the gradient. It arrives in one of the arrives in one of the valleys at some point. Stochastic gradient descent is much more erratic. It might miss one of the local minima and end up in another minima. Yeah, and here you see just the, the line plot from these. Yeah, so it misses this minimum but ends up here with almost the same starting point. So it's it's very surprising that stochastic gradient descent, although I mean this problem is also highly non-convex, finds a good local minimum. And then if you if you think about this, this landscape where things operate over is very um, difficult and complex. I mean it's even more surprising. Okay. So let's look now at this uh, key theoretical question. So the first is, that's the first also you do, you choose an architecture. The question is which architecture to choose, um, which affects the performance of deep learning. And that requires a lot of tools from mathematics like a harmonic analysis, approximation theory, and so on. This is maybe the most explored question uh, nowadays with the most theoretical results. The second is the learning itself, stochastic gradient descent. Why does it converge to good local minima? Despite the problem is highly non-convex. And so also there are a lot of different tools for mathematics, which people now throw at it. Even let's say very, um, let's say theoretical, I mean, from pure mathematics, like algebraic geometry, analyzing, let's say the shape of the, of the, of the uh, local minima and aiming to understand whether the flatness has a certain effect on the learning algorithm. Then uh, generalization, what is the role of depth? And also in particular, why do large neural networks not overfit? Generalization in general is, I mean, what, what's the out of sample error? No? So why, why is the test error so, so low? Why does the double descent phenomena happen? And this usually goes in the direction of statistics uh, learning theory. These three components are exactly also the three components of a statistical learning error. Uh, so and if you solve all three, I mean, you can get a very good estimate of the overall error of the problem. Um, later on, I will show you a little bit also in this direction uh, in a bit more depth. Um, but let me mention at this point, there is also another direction which I actually like very much these days, which is explainability. So this asks the question, why did a trained neural network reach a certain decision which features are uh, maybe also learned? That requires also a lot of maybe different tools. So what you see here is also that overall mathematics, I mean, various areas are touched by, by those problems. So as I said, I mean, this area of expressivity, uh, explainability, I find very exciting. Um, though I think there are still, I mean, a huge need to put it on more rigorous feet. But let me just show you um, a little bit what, what this is about. Uh, and so, I mean, the, the main goal is to understand decisions of these black box predictors. And so what would you, for instance, aim at is if, if you have a neural network, which is fixed already, it was trained, and let's say it says this is a three. Yeah, then you would like to know which pixels are were most important for the decision. And obviously, I mean, these openings here might be very important for the decision um, because this distinguishes a three from an eight. Yeah, so one would maybe expect that the explainability algorithm marks this as important. And hopefully it is then also important for the neural network. Now, so the explainability approach typically outputs like a heat map indicating which pixels were for that particular neural network most important. And so for instance, if now the neural network classified this accidentally as an eight, one might hope that these openings would be labeled as blue because they would play against the decision that that's an eight. But I mean, there are questions in this, this direction. What exactly is relevance in a mathematical sense? I mean, there's still a huge open gap 
um, in, in, in theory, um, what is what are optimal relevance maps, because if you want to fairly compare them, that's what you need. What about other modalities? Um, and ultimately, we would like to have a decision which, in a certain sense, um, an explanation which is indistinguishable from a human being and also an explanation for any questions one can ask. So this requires a lot of, let's say, interdisciplinarity and also, also novel mathematics. So let me show you two, two examples which we derived. So this is something, I mean, this is an explainability approach based on our distortion theory on information theory. So it's a bit more theoretical maybe, but still I think it lacks a lot of uh, theory. So what you see here, this comes from telecommunication. Um, you see here a city map, these blue buildings, the red points are cell phone users. And here this white dot is a cell tower. And uh, the neural network now computed this black and white background, which indicated at each point how strong the signal there is. The darker, the worse. Ah, and so what you observe here is that, strangely enough, I mean, here it's clear that here you have a bad reception, but here you seem to also have a bad reception, which is not, um, yeah, which is not clear at all. and seems to be also wrong because you stand then right in front of the cell tower. And so while these explainability methods, what we found out is that the network has based its decision to make this part dark uh, on these cell phone users, which have bad reception. And so what turned out later on, because that we found out is that then we saw that there is actually a building missing in the city map. So in that sense, the neural network did something correct, but I mean, initially there was something wrong. Uh, but so that you can find out why these explainability methods. What you can also, if you introduce a little more theory, so so-called wavelets and uh, look not just as pixel-based explanations, but at more higher level explanations with looking at features, then you can also analyze adversarial examples to a certain extent. So you have a network which outputs here a, the word diaper, which I mean has nothing to do with dog. So that's that's certainly wrong. And here it outputs screw. And it's also wrong because there's no screw in this image. If you look at the pixel-based explanations, I mean, um, why the network reached those decisions, you don't see anything. I mean, there's no reason why this should be a diaper or this is screw. But then if you, let's say, improve your explainability method a little bit, then what you see is this image and this looks a little like a baby. Uh, so that's what, apparently what the network saw and then concluded that diaper would be the correct classification class. And here, um, it also looks a bit like a screw. Um, so that might be the reason for misclassification. Okay, so that is mathematics for deep learning. Then there's the other direction, deep learning for mathematics. And um, so here I said, I mean, there's a whole area of inverse problems where we can ask how to, how we can compare deep learning, combine deep learning with, let's say, model-based approaches. Also, there are a lot of mathematical tools go in that direction. NPDEs, so asking questions like, I mean, why do neural networks perform that well in high dimensional regimes? So the first question I would like to just briefly discuss with you are deep neural networks at least as good as all previous methods? Yeah, so that's something what you first want to check and you will see that that's the case and later on that they are even better. So for that, I, I will, and this is maybe the most theoretical part of this talk, um, go a bit, a bit in the theory and um, because what, what is key usually for all these, these problems are approximation. Yeah? So if you solve those problems, you typically aim to approximate the solution to a certain extent. And this is how a neural numerical approach goes. And so then you can ask the question, are neural networks as good approximators as previous methods? And there are previous methods like, for instance, wavelets, which come from JPEG 2000 standard. And so one can show that neural networks are as good at approximations as wavelets, for instance. And so let's, let's take a brief look at how the theory then goes in that direction. So what, what I mean, what, what function approximation is about is, is usually you have your favorite class of functions, um, you have your favorite representation system, uh, wavelets, for instance. Um, and you want to analyze how good this representation system is for this class of functions. What you do then is um, you, you take an element of your class of functions 
Then you have a budget capital N. You're allowed to check, choose two N elements of this, building a linear combination and approximating F in such a way that this linear combination best approximates F. Uh, and so then that way you certainly make an error and that's the error of best n-term approximation. Yeah? So it's a fundamental notion there. You have a budget and you would like to, with a linear combination approximates to F. Then if you increase your budget, you do better and better and better. So the error goes to zero and you get a certain rate. And this rate is key now how good this system is for this class for approximation. So what you set into relation is the approximation accuracy with the complexity of the approximating system in terms of sparsity, because what you want is you want approximation with very two terms because from a computational viewpoint, this is very efficient. Now, so that's the viewpoint of classical function approximation. Let's fill this a bit with life because this we will need also at one point later. Um, so there's a very um, canonical class of functions. These are called cartoon-like functions, but the basic idea is that for instance, if you have natural images or here images of buildings, they, they typically have very distinctive edges. And these are also important because the human brain is very tuned towards edges. Uh, and so this, this model class of functions now um, encodes this. And so the, these functions typically look like this. Uh, so you have here an interior and an out, outside part, and you have something smooth here and here, and then you have a distinctive this continuity curve. Now, so the functions look like this from our model class, and this is the precise mathematical definition. And so then it was also proven by, by Donohue that under certain conditions, the optimal rate for any representation system for this class is n to the minus one. So that's a benchmark result. It shows you cannot get beyond that. And so one, one aims to look for representation systems which now behave as good as possible for this class achieving this rate. And so this you can do. I mean, um, if you're familiar with wavelets, they look like this. So you have a function which you scale and then you move around on the plane. So it's a typical definition for wavelets and they don't achieve this rate. So you can see that in a certain sense easily here, if it's a little squares, if you approximate a function, in particular, a curve or let's say an edge by these wavelets, you need many more than if your elements would be anisotropic. And so this led us to the definition of shearlets, um, which are based on scaling. So you have a means to zoom into the signal um, in both directions in a different way. So you get anisotropic shape elements. These systems are also based on shearing. So you can change the orientation of those elements. Um, we don't use rotation because this would destroy um, the digitalization. You don't get a faithful implementation that way. But then if you put everything together, that looks awfully complicated. But if you look here, for instance, you see it resembles very much what we did before. We have here scaling, we have translation, and now we have again also this operator to change the orientation. Anyhow, so this shielded system, if you define it in that way, you can show it gives you this rate. It behaves optimally up to a log factor um, with respect to this um, class of functions. And I mean, if you're interested in that in general, I mean, imaging sciences, um, you can take also a look at our webpage, shielet.org, where we have a lot of different types of code for download. OK, so this slide we already saw. It gives a bit, um, let's say, insight into that. We have here, for instance, the class of cartoon like functions and here, shields. Okay, so now we bring everything to the deep learning world um, and want to check whether neural networks are as good as, for instance, shields and wavelets. This is the, again, copied from the previous slide, what a neural network is. We need now also a measure for complexity of a neural network because we need to then measure the complexity uh, remember, for this function approximation, we, we counted how many terms we have, and now we need a substitute measure for counting. And so this counting is the complexity in terms of memory efficiency. Uh, so what you see here is we count, so this L0 norm counts the number of non-zero entries. So you count the number of non-zero entries of the weight matrices and the bias vector, 
and um, sum that up over the layers and that gives you your measure for complexity. It's not the only possible one, but it's a very canonical one. And so then you write neural network with L layers that complexity input dimension and activation function. Okay, so now, I mean, we want to set into relation approximation accuracy with the complexity of the approximating network in terms of memory efficiency. Um, yeah, and the memory efficiency is measured by this complexity. There's a very, very classical result, very old result for approximation theory um, for neural networks. So in a nutshell, it says, if I have a function on a compact domain, it can be approximated with arbitrary accuracy with a shallow neural network, with networks of that type. Yeah, and so here you see that the details, you have a function, continuous function on a compact domain. Your activation function also need to satisfy certain properties. Then for every accuracy, you find a neural network of this shape, which approximates that F with that accuracy. Yeah, and so you see here, this is exactly a neural network of that type. You see here the, the first layer, then the activation function, and then you sum everything up, which gives you this part. Okay, so here the complexity can be arbitrary large. I mean, that, that's a problem. Um, there are a lot of other results, which in a sense make this a bit more precise, going also to other, sorry, to other function classes. You see here this result, for instance, from Jarotsky, which is quite nice, sets into relation the complexity or brings into play also the complexity. Um, which is what we want, but still, I mean, this result is not, is not optimal. Um, for an optimality result, one needs a lower bound. And so uh, one lower bound, what one can achieve is for instance, um, this result, which says, I have my favorite function class. I have an abstract learning procedure, um, which takes an accuracy and an element of my class and it outputs a neural network which approximates that F with that accuracy. Now, so that's usually a very high level learning type algorithm. And then what one can show is that um, the product between epsilon to gamma and this complexity co converts to infinity, meaning the complexity converts to infinity faster than epsilon to gamma goes to zero. So this shows that there's a lower bound a conceptual lower bound for the complexity. And so one can then check whether this lower bound can be met. Yeah, so whether we can have optimally memory efficient neural networks. And so this can be achieved in this limit case. Uh, and so the, the, the basic idea is to transfer everything what you know from theoretical approximation theory to now the deep learning world. Uh, so we take a representation system which for that class of functions we are interested in already gives us an optimal rate, like Schielitz. We realize the elements by neural networks because neural networks, after all, are just functions. And then we mimic everything what we did before, like this enter approximation by network. So this leads to networks of, of this type, let's say an input in R2, an output in R. And in these compartments, one has, for instance, wavelets or shearlets, and then combines them. That's the the sum of the enter approximation. So in any case, so once, yeah, so one can go through this and then achieve, for instance, the result of this type, which says that, for instance, for the cartoon-like functions, we can always find a network which has a complexity of O of N so that the approximation is of this optimal order N to the minus one. Yeah, so in a sense, I mean, one can con construct optimally memory efficient neural networks. So this shows the first bound is sharp and also shows deep learning, deep neural networks achieve optimal approximation properties of all affine systems combined. So they behave as good as wavelets and shields and all those systems which we, which we introduced. And what's even more interesting maybe or intriguing is that if you look now at these compartments um, and train the neural network on functions and look at what it learns, because in the proof we put, let's say, wavelets or shields there, but looking at what it learns, then in these compartments, it indeed learns something similar to the representation systems we before theoretically construct. 
So here, if we try to learn this function, which is a function from R2 to R, the network in these compartments will output something like, which looks like what we call from theory, which list. Or if one tries to learn this function in these compartments with a special architecture, it learns something close to shear uh, So in that sense, I mean, the network seems to also sense um, and mimic what approximation theory does. Okay, so neural networks are as good from that viewpoint as uh, previous methods and are they really better? So now I would like to take you briefly into the world of inverse problems and show you why people are that excited about neural networks. There. So uh, inverse problem is um, something of that type. You have your input image, you do something with it. For instance, you take out certain parts, you get the output, which is then this, and then you would like to invert this process and get this image back. Yeah, so it means inverting this operation or operator. Uh, and so this could put, for instance, put noise on the image, it could take something out and so on. It could also be a CT scanner where you then want to get your real image from the measurements. And a classical solution is this, uh, what's called Tikhonov regularization. We aim to minimize this. You see, if you minimize this, you want to solve this problem as accurately as possible. You bring it down to zero, you get a solution F, which indeed satisfies this equality. And then there's this regularization or penalty term where people often take and use this idea that there are representation systems which behave nicely for certain classes of functions like wavelets or shearlets and use this as a regularization term. Yeah, and so this alpha balances how much weight you put on one of those. And so there are typical approaches in deep learning. For instance, um, what people do is, I mean, either you first solve this problem and then apply a neural network afterwards to take care of the artifacts. That's like a very ad hoc approach. Or you, for instance, look at this algorithm which solves this problem and then observe that this algorithm which solves this problem actually has certain steps like a denoising step. And so these steps you then replace by a neural network. So overall, you seem to still be able to solve this problem, but you improve the algorithm itself that way. Um, let me show you one, one also example from what we did, which combine combines previous methods with deep learning in, um, let's say, maybe a bit more sophisticated manner. And so this comes from um, the problem I would like to just briefly discuss with you is indeed CT. Computer tomography, CT scanner does the following. Um, you have here a human body, for instance, or a body, let's say. It computes line integrals through it. This gives you one slice of the sinogram and then you rotate it. Yeah, so you rotate it and this way you fill the sinogram. Uh, and so this is related to the Radon transform. So this is the Radon transform of this image. And then from this so-called sinogram, the measurements, you want to reconstruct the interior of the human body. And this becomes really hard if you cannot sample everything. Low dose CT is not such a huge problem. So there you, for instance, sample each second angle. Um, but what is much more a problem if you cannot do the full rotation, if you have, let's say, a whole chunk, uh, what is missing. So that's, for instance, the case in electron tomography. So there, then for your sinogram, you have a whole area missing. And so then you just reconstruct from this part, and that certainly creates a lot of artifacts, which you see here. If you have a 60 degree angle missing, this is your original image. You do very crude reconstruction from this very partial measurements, you get this. And if you use this sparse regularization that I showed you on the previous slide with shearlets, you get this, but still you get a lot of artifacts as you see here. And so what we did was we looked at it a bit more closely. What you observe is that, I mean, you see here reconstructions from different missing angles. The larger the missing angle, the worse. What you observe if you reconstruct is that already at a very early stage, although you just have measurements from a very small angle, you see already here very precisely the edges. And that depends very strongly on the direction they have. 
Yeah, so some of the edges are already visible at a very early stage, others are not. Yeah, and so this depends certainly on the angle where you compute your line integrals. So if you compute them this way, then these will be smeared out. But here you will see that there is an edge because one time you have something positive and then you have zero. Okay, so this you can explore. And so this edge and its direction, there's a mathematical framework for putting that in. That's so-called the so-called wave front set. So these are points on the edge together with the direction. And so if you reconstruct, you're missing a certain part. Yeah. So in here, you see that's the wave front set of this image, basically. Yeah. So you see here the third axis, which gives you the angle. And for each point on this on the edge, you get one point here on this angle. And then, I mean, shields behave very nicely with respect to wave front set, so you can identify it. Um, it can separate these two parts. And so then, I mean, one can drive an algorithm of this type um, where you see here, it is this, this uh, normal sparse regularization. You see here the, the penalty term, yes. you see the Radon transform, you have the measurement G, you would like to compute the input image so that this is almost equal to zero. And you have here the regularization term, which is the shielded transform to these inner products between F and shields with the L1 norm weighted. Then you get this uh, not that great reconstruction, and then you apply another shielded transform. And this reveals what has been accurately recovered and what not. Because some of these coefficients are almost equal to zero and the others are reliable. And these you keep, these you don't touch. So this also now increases the reliability of the reconstruction. The ones which are equal to zero, you now learn through a neural network, you learn basically the invisible ones from the visible ones. You train your neural network from those to learn the invisible ones, and then you put everything together. And so what you get then, you, you see here, um, so this, again, you have a 60 degree missing angle. That's the screwed reconstruction. That's the best, well, almost the best model-based reconstruction without learning. That's using a neural network on the entire image. Um, and there you see already, that is maybe not such a great idea to just use a neural network end to end, but it's much better to incorporate some physical knowledge, some domain knowledge. Yeah, and so this is the, the approach we drove and you see it's much better than, than the other. Yeah, so here you see that deep neural networks can outperform the classical methods indeed by far. So therefore people are so excited about that. Um, yeah, and so this is another image where the question now was to do edge detection and um, the color coding indicates the direction of the edges. Good, so let me now briefly in the, um, I don't know, do I have maybe five more minutes, Eugenio, or how many, how much time do I still have? Uh, or two I minutes? Okay, yes, uh, five, 10 minutes, okay. Okay, okay. Okay, so yeah, so let me touch also just very briefly on, on, on PDE, some partial differential equations. Um, so what people typically do is they, replace the solution of a PDE by a neural network and then train the neural network. Yeah, and so in the training of the neural network, you certainly then incorporate the partial differential equation as um, in, in your loss function. Now, so that's a very classical approach. And so what I now just briefly want to show you is a, let's say a much more general setting, which are parametric PDEs, um, where you have a family of PDEs, which are guided by a parameter, let's say y. Uh, and so here you have a differential operator, you have your right hand side, which depends on this parameter y, you have a solution u, which depends on y, and you have also y in maybe a non-trivial way incorporated in everything. And so what you want is from the, from the parameter, you would like to compute the solution. And then the parameter might be a design parameter. So each time you change the parameter, you would like to get the new solution. So this runs into the curve of dimensionality if the dimension here of this y is very high. And so now, I mean, we bring it into the final dimensional world. This is how you bring it in. You choose, let's say something, um, a high fidelity discretization space. So you bring it from the continuous world in the 
in the in the dis in the finite world, but with a high dimension usually. Uh, and so this is what you then want to solve. Um, going for neural networks, we can then ask questions like the solution. Can you approximate this with neural networks for any parameter? And in particular, what is the complexity of this neural network? How does it depend on the, the dimension of my, um, of my parameter space and also the dimension of this discretization? Does it behave in a benign manner or does it uh, obey the cross of dimensionality? And then how does it perform numerically? And so what, what one can show is that indeed neural networks can approximate this parametric map and indeed they beat the cross of dimensionality in this sense. And uh, they also do that uh, if you then look at it from a numerical viewpoint. Uh, so then, I mean, we do have extensive numerical experiments in all of those, one could see that the performance does not suffer from the cross of dimensionality. So let me finish my talk with a word of caution. Um, because one can also look at things from a much more fundamental viewpoint. In fact, I mean, the whole area of, of, of let's say, deep learning. Um, so a computable problem, computable on a digital machine is something for which you can compute this input output relation with for any given accuracy. Yeah, and for our digital machines are um, computers, digital hardware, which is usually modeled, I mean, if you work in computer science, you know about the Turing model, the Turing machine. I mean, this is usually the model for our classical digital hardware on which we train neural networks. And what one can show is that, for instance, uh, the solution of a fine dimensional inverse problem is not computable by a deep neural network. No, and not computable in this Turing sense and even in a much more general sense, in the banach mazur sense, I mean, if, if that means something to you. No? But this is says, I mean, you cannot, I mean, if, even if you have, let's say, error bars, um, you, you cannot say for certain that your result, which you get from your computation on your computer, obeys these error bars because it's not computable. You, you cannot access it. There's no way. Yeah, so this is certainly, I mean, a key fundamental issue. I mean, you can say it looks good, but I mean, if you compute the problem on your digital machine, I mean, you, you don't have any way to tell something about the accuracy of the outcome. So it means, I mean, there is no algorithm on which digital hardware derives new networks which approximate the solution for any given accuracy. So in that sense, the output is not reliable, so there are no guarantees. And it could lead, it doesn't need, it could lead, or it, sorry, it could explain also why there are these instabilities and the non-robustness. Uh, and so there's this, this barrier um, of computability on today's hardware. So the question is um, how to deal with that. And there are certainly a lot of other models where people now head towards for computing, like neuromorphic computing, biocomputing. Um, these are just some examples. And the question is, what about these non-computability results? Do they hold also for those? And in fact, I mean, we showed that the solution of a fine dimension inverse problem is indeed computable on a certain model of analog machines. So this shows that, I mean, one should seriously think of training neural networks, I mean, not on the classical hardware, but maybe on other, other types of um, emerging hardware. And one should need to just be aware of this, this problem in the background. Okay, so I think, I mean, from my perspective, deep learning shows impressive performance and applications. The theoretic foundation is, I mean, largely missing. There's a lot of new mathematics required. Uh, we touched upon those areas um, from mathematics for deep learning, expressivity learning, generalization, explainability, the reverse direction deep learning for mathematics. We, we looked a little bit into inverse problems and partial differential equations. Ah, and so, I mean, these are, again, I mean, a summary of the key questions which you discussed also during the talk. What is the role of depth, network architecture, gradient descent, why doesn't overfit high dimensional regimes, which, which features are learned. And in the end, also are neural networks capable of replacing numerical algorithms. So um, from my viewpoint as a mathematician, I have to say, I mean, there are really exciting future perspectives of, for mathematics. Mathematics is uh, also desperately needed. And with this, I'd like to conclude my talk and thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Kutiniok. And now it's time for, for questions. So now it's time, the, the time of our audience to make uh, whatever question they want, okay? All of you that want to make a question, please or hands your, uh, stand your hand or, or write in the chat, on the chat, okay, that you want to, to, make, a, to make a question. So feel free. Okay, Ivan Serillano, I guess. Yes, Ivan Serillano. Okay, go ahead. Ivan? Yeah, sorry, I just uh, got confused. Okay. Uh, I just, um, thanks for the presentation, really nice to hear. I'm also um, working on explainable AI and it's very interesting your, your work on that. And I would like to highlight or at least um, uh, could you put the, the um, uh, part where you talk about the um, the um, the overfitting uh, underfitting uh, presentation? Because I, I think it impressed me that uh, at the end the um, um, the after overfitting it uh, comes again to not overfitting. I mean, I, I, it really surprised me. And just uh, a bit more explanation, please. Just. Um, or send the uh, work where it is explained? Yeah, so I mean, I would wish to be able to answer your question, but this is still, I mean, one, one open mystery. There are some works in that direction. I mean, people believe that the training algorithm somehow has some sort of inner regulation, regularization to a certain extent. I mean, there are, I mean, in former times, people aim to look at VC dimension using tools of that type, rather maha complexity. Nowadays, for instance, neural tangent kernels is a very popular direction aiming to explain this double descent phenomena. But still, I mean, it's, it's a wide open field. Oh, okay, okay, thanks. Um, also about um, explainability, um, I just want to uh, ask you about, I mean, I, as I said, I work on this explainable uh, explainable artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And um, I just want to say that I'm so interested in the um, formalization of what's an explanation. And I also, I did an, another presentation like two weeks ago or something like that, where I also proposed kind of um, formalization of mm -hmm. uh, some of those things. And um, mm, is your work on the, um, the modern mathematics for the, of the learning on this, um, Direction? I think so. Oh, so, so, so I, I didn't get the last part. Okay, uh, just uh, asking if um, there is more um, specification, more. yeah, on the um, on this work because I want to read it and also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean we, we have a survey article of this yeah approach okay. of okay. distortion theory, um, so you can find it on, on the web page. Um, or, I mean, if you like, you can also send me an email, then I can send you the link. Yeah, okay, um, I think I found it. And yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll text you if something's not clear, but thanks for, thanks again. Okay, sure. Um, are there any more questions? Okay, I have a question, okay. Um, uh, Professor Coutinho, so it's not okay about the presentation, but I want to know your opinion. Okay, keep learning now. Okay, uh, you know, okay, it's the state of the art in most of the tasks, but I guess we have a kind of problem because, okay, it's related to your presentation in the sense that I'm going to ask you about complexity because uh, all the uh, new deep learning models, uh, in particular in natural language processing with uh, all those language models, that they are, they, all of them, they are very complex, okay? So you know that it has a lot of parameters, okay? All the new language models uh, have a lot of parameters. So, okay, we have the problem of how to, to proceed with these new complex uh, deep learning models in, in a world that we, we also need to, to be aware about the efficiency, okay, how to, to reach good results, but with efficient models, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, in the line of uh, the, the green AI, green artificial intelligence. So, 
What do you think about this uh, career, uh, about uh, accuracy career that we are going, okay, more and we are using more and more parameters, okay, I guess more and more depth and also more and more complexity. So what do you think about what is the, 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 the how we, can we work or, how, or what uh, should be the, the direction to go in deep learning in order, okay, to reach good results, uh, yeah. uh, try to, to, okay, to keep a balance, okay, between uh, complexity and accuracy. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting question. Um, so I think what one observes these days, and in particular the big companies like Google, Facebook, and so on, I mean, they have huge computing power. And so they are then able, for instance, this alpha fold two, or I mean, uh, also natural language processing also needs a lot of that. And so they usually then have in that regime, I mean, the, the best results because, yeah, I mean, this, this, this really shows, I mean, the more power you have, the, the more you can do. And that's also a problem for the universities to a certain extent. Um, now, now for, let's say the efficiency. Um, yeah, I mean, I wish there would be more emphasis on how to compress neural networks and uh, how to also work with smaller models. But yeah, so I feel, I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it's more the, the bigger, the better. I mean, that's that seems to be the, the motto right now, because as I said, I mean, these companies have these huge, huge uh, computing centers. Um, but yeah, I mean, so I think that's the situation. I mean, um, but I, I agree with you, it would be certainly um, important to also look in the other direction, whether you need, whether you can also get away with, with smaller, smaller networks, um, another, point in that direction might be also, as I said, to use different um, hardware types. Uh, so I yeah. mean, maybe with that, um, you can also solve to a certain extent uh, this requirement of, of huge amount of energy for that. Okay, I see, okay. Uh, we have a, a, a real challenge, okay? How to, to compress uh, neural networks because, okay, if you go to bigger, bigger model, okay, I guess uh, it's a bit, it will be a problem. So, okay, I think it's uh, a great, we have a great uh, future. Okay, so are there any more questions uh, for our audience? Okay, so in this case, uh, Professor, I want to again uh, uh, thanks for your uh, talk. It was a very uh, nice talk, uh, interesting. And challenging for us, okay. Uh, and I know that uh, uh, we're going to review this recording several times in order to get to get all the insights from from you. Uh, okay. I hope. Okay. okay you let me please uh, first, uh, Gita. Thank you very much by your excellent talk. Really, I, I have enjoyed. Uh, I would like to, to ask you. Uh, we have here Joaquin Perez, is the director of the Mathematical Institute of the University of Granada. And we are discussing uh, Joaquin and the member of the Institute, together with the member of our Artificial Intelligence Institute. We are uh, discussing the possibility to, to start a joint um, research line, trying to put together uh, people from the area of mathematics and people from the area of, of artificial intelligence. Uh, from our side, from our Institute, more applying deep learning in different, different areas. In the near future, we would like to have the possibility to, to maintain the, the, the contact with you and to discuss the potential uh, collaboration, even the possibility uh, if uh, finally we have some uh, PhD student together, we hope because we are trying to prepare to have a, a common program for PhD student, the possibility to discuss with you potential collaboration and to, to have the, the guide by member of your team, the possibility to have the collaboration to push our and research lines and, and research studies in the in the foundation of mathematics for the learning and the potential uh, topics that we can we want to discuss between both institutes and and to explore the potential collaboration with with your team and your uh, your collaborators. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, that would be very interesting for me. And I mean, also yeah, good luck for you to to set up that. I think it's a it's a great, great idea. I mean, I, I think also, as you said, I mean, in particular from these exchanges of PhD students, I think everybody benefits a lot. Thanks. Joaquin, we have 
we have to start the, the work to, to start to, to the discussion of the of the PhD, the, the collaboration with PhD student, and we have this opportunity for for collaboration in the near future. Okay. Sure, this uh, would be very interesting. Uh, by the way, I would like to thank uh, Professor Kartnock for the very nice talk, and also just a little question. You mentioned at the beginning of the talk uh, manifolds, but everything I have uh, seen here in the talk is uh, functions that uh, are defined on Euclidean spaces. Uh, what is? Would you would you say something about the contribution of geometry to to deep learning? I mean, how, yeah. How do you plug manifolds inside? Yeah, I mean, the, I think uh, if you say in general, I mean, contribution of geometry, I mean, it's, it's actually, there are a lot of different contributions. So for instance, if you look at the energy landscape over which you optimize, I mean, then you can analyze it from a geometric viewpoint, from a topological viewpoint in a certain sense. I mean, what shape or geometric shape do these uh, local minima have? Um, does it depend on the flatness of those, whether these are good local minima for generalization or not? So also there, I mean, geometry plays a, a tremendous role. Uh, much more than um, this is manifold which I mentioned. So what I mentioned there was just, um, I mean, often these functions, these high dimensional functions are not defined on the entire space, but on a lower dimensional manifold. So and in that sense, I mean, um, that, that's the typical typical definition. So then, I mean, if you have that setting, certainly also the, the geometry in these approximation results come, come into play, but usually the way you, you play it then is that you have charts and that you go from the manifold then, I mean, to like, like, like we, we always do to, um, okay. uh, to the tenant spaces and uh, draw everything from the Euclidean domain back to the manifold. Thank you. Thank you. Well, sorry, Eugenio. Uh, thank you very much, Gita. Please continue and finish, Eugenio. Oh, we don't hear you. Um. I'm sorry, I was a mute. Uh, the, if uh, there is no more questions, uh, thanks, Paco and Joaquin, for your last uh, uh, interventions. Okay, so thanks again, uh, Gita. And uh, I hope, okay, we can set up our uh, internal collaboration with the Mathematical Institute and also with you in our international collaboration. I hope this talk. Uh, could be this starting point for those for joining forces, okay, about us and to contribute in this uh, amazing challenge of uh, mathematics and deep learning and artificial intelligence. So, thanks again, Dita. Uh, nice uh, to meet in this uh, uh, evening. So, bye bye and uh, see you for the next uh, seminar. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye. Bye, thanks. Thank you.